So the theme of last week's show was basically that Joe Biden is a gigantic gaffe machine who keeps putting his foot in his mouth. And it's not just that he keeps saying things that are absurd and even incoherent, but he says things that are easily disprovable. Things that you can just Google, take five seconds to Google and see, oh, he's not telling the truth. And the things that he's being the most dishonest about are things regarding his own record. So, as you all know, he was one of the authors of the 1994 crime bill. And if I'm one of Joe Biden's advisors, I would be telling him, disavow the crime bill unequivocally, run away from it, apologize anytime it's brought up, don't brag about the crime bill, Joe, even if you want to, even if this is one of your signature accomplishments, because it was a disaster. Right? That's how I would be advising Joe Biden. But the problem with Joe Biden is that he's kind of difficult to advise because this is someone who is so narcissistic that he can't fathom the thought that something he did previously backfired, that it was atrocious, it was a failure. So, of course, since he's not advisable, he's going to do something that he obviously should not do and that I would speculate his advisors would tell him not to do. And that is brag about the crime bill. And yes, brag about the crime bill. So he did this last week on two separate occasions. He claimed not just that the crime bill wasn't bad, but that it actually did not lead to mass incarceration, as Sean King points out here in this tweet, and who was rightfully offended by Joe Biden's obvious bullshit. So if you work for Joe Biden, how do you spin this? Like, how are you supposed to convince people that Joe Biden, who is a complete idiot, isn't an idiot after he said something that is that easily disprovable. He claims that the crime bill didn't lead to mass incarceration. It did. That's just a fact. It exacerbated mass incarceration. So maybe you can say, well, look, it was already an issue and Joe Biden was jumping on the bandwagon of a broader trend that was initially, you know, catalyzed by Nixon with the war on drugs. Say something like that. But the problem is that you can't really find a way to defend Joe Biden without looking disingenuous because... Clearly, the crime bill is one of the worst aspects about Joe Biden, and there are many things on his record that are absolutely disgusting. Anita Hill, you know, his homophobic past, his racist past. But here's what's going to happen. A senior advisor for Joe Biden, Simone Sanders, is going to be asked about his statement uh, about the crime bill. She's going to try to defend him and expectedly it's not going to go too well. And we heard from Senator uh, Harris uh, in that uh, piece from Arlette about uh, her refuting a claim that the vice president made this week that the 1994 crime bill that he wrote did not um, contribute to mass incarceration. I want you to listen to former President Bill Clinton. This is uh, President Clinton who signed that into law in 2015. I signed a bill that made the problem worse. And I want to admit it, but in that bill, there were longer sentences. And most of these people are in prison under state law, but the federal law set a trend. And that was overdone. We were wrong about that. President Clinton says that, that they were wrong about that. Senator Harris has said that it contributed to mass incarceration. Why is it uh, Vice President Biden a admitting what we're hearing from the former president? Well, look, I think what we can go back to Vice President Biden's comments at the National Action Network breakfast in January, where he noted um, that the, the, the crime bill, by way of this disparity between crack and powder cocaine, trapped an entire generation of people. Look, I think many people will tell you across the country, Victor, black folks included, um, that, the, that the crime bill and the reaction to what was happening in the early 90s, now look, I, wasn't, I was only about three or four, but I'm a student of history. What was happening in the early 90s, um, the reaction was was an overcorrection to a very real issue. But we are going to see some policy rollouts from um, our campaign very soon, Victor. I know folks have questions so, about so, uh, what uh, is Vice President Biden's criminal justice is, policy. It, is it now the, the, those are going to come. Now but I mean, the, campaign's the campaign's position that the crime bill did contribute to mass incarceration? Victor, I think the vice with the vice, the vice president, uh, his comments speak for themselves. What is very well, clear his, is but his this, comment that was that it does has, not contribute to mass incarceration. 
the former president who signed his, it said and, it and did. if we and if look Victor if we play the whole clip what he also said was his comment was what he also said was that the majority of folks that are incarcerated were incarcerated at the state level and there's and a that reason for that let me put up let me put up the truth in sentencing and, 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 there, and I mean there is a reason but for there's that. a reason let me put it up let I mean, me put it put it up on the screen guys the truth in sentencing section of the 1994 crime bill this is page 21 it incentivized uh, it offered billions of dollars to build new uh, correctional facilities if states would increase the percentage of convicted violent offenders, increase the average prison time, increase the percentage of the sentence was there. Did this bill not incentivize putting more people in jail and keeping them there longer? The, uh, Victor. I no, I am not going to sit here and tell you the crime bill was perfect. There was some, there was some really great preventative things that it did. It took on the NRA, NRA, and then there was an overcorrection. What you're describing was an overcorrection. There was a reach. Some folks went too far. The bill wasn't perfect. Republicans fought to put a lot of things in that bill. Democrats fought, Democrats fought to get a lot of things out of the bill. But at the end of the day, Victor, at the end of the day, no one is suggesting that what has happened, what has ravaged communities um, over the last 27 yeah. years, uh, does not need to be fixed. No one is suggesting that there is not a real issue, there's not a real problem or a real right. issue. And I'm here to tell you that Vice President Biden will have roll out. You'll see a criminal justice policy soon. We are going to continue to have to have this conversation about the crime bill um, all all right. throughout the campaign trail. But we're also going to put forward some policies, Victor. So just well, wait and see. Give us a minute. Wait we, and see. We will look forward to those. That was bad. That was really bad. That, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the reasons why you shouldn't defend the indefensible. Because you can't. And when Victor Blackwell asked her a question and she just kind of like laughed and said, <laughs> Victor... I, like, literally cringed. It was like a physical reaction. <laughs> Victor, I think the vice with the... Because you knew that she was drawing a blank. How do you defend, like, how do you respond? And I don't usually say this, but good job, CNN. Victor Blackwell is probably one of the better hosts on CNN, and what he did right there was phenomenal journalism because she try to divert, you know, the scrutiny away from Joe Biden by saying, well, like the states were already doing this, but he pulled up a portion of the bill that described explicitly how the crime bill incentivized mass incarceration. You just, you can't rebound from that. You're done. At that moment, when that's brought up, you're done. You can't defend the crime bill. And that's kind of where we saw her jump off the sinking ship. You can't defend that. You, you just cannot. But then she was pinned into a corner and was asked, well, so is the campaign's official position now, since you're saying this, that the crime bill did lead to mass incarceration? I mean, wow. And I'm saying this as someone who actually has the utmost respect for Simone Sanders just as a strategist, because she's someone who, she actually is a talented figure. So the fact that she was easily backed into a corner by a CNN host shows you that Joe Biden is going to have a tough time in the months coming ahead. And the thing that makes me so sad about Simone Sanders is that she actually used to work for Bernie Sanders, literally. In 2016, she was Bernie's uh, national press spokesperson, and now she's working for Joe Biden. She is talented enough, charismatic enough to where she could have done anything, and now she's choosing to work for Joe Biden. You go from the best to the worst? I don't, like, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I mean, you'd think that if anyone was going to work for the establishment, it would have been back in 2016 when everyone was telling her that Hillary Clinton was going to win. But she jumped on Bernie's boat because she believed in what Bernie Sanders was talking about. And now she clearly does not believe in what Joe Biden is saying. So my question is, how do you rationalize Working for Biden after you worked for Bernie. How do you go from one end of the spectrum to the opposite? How do you do that? She was actually asked, and she obviously and expectedly, again, did not have a good answer. Obvious question. You were the 2016 uh, national spokesperson for the Bernie Sanders campaign. Why are you now on Team Biden? 
Well, look, I think uh, Vice President Biden is going to show everyone today uh, exactly why I decided to join the campaign. Look, he, we are in a fight for the soul of this nation. And uh, I believe that this is a pivotal point, just not in American history, but in the world history. We have to make a decision about who it is that we want to be, where it is we're going to go. And I believe that Vice President Biden uh, has the right vision uh, to take us there. So I'm very excited to be on Team Biden. I'm excited to be here in Philadelphia, Victor. Okay? Uh -huh. We are kicking off officially our campaign today and I, I really think what you're going to hear from the vice president is a bookend on these themes that you've been hearing from us since he first um, okay. announced that he is running all right look good on joe biden for recruiting her because i do think that she's talented politically but that was not a good answer that was not convincing like I'm, i don't believe that simone sanders actually thinks joe biden is good for the country quote we're gonna fight for the soul of this nation Vice President Biden has the right vision. Really, Simone? Really? What are you doing? Why? Why throw your credibility down the drain for someone like Joe Biden, who is painfully, painfully out of touch? And you can't say that, oh, well, you know, she's just jumping on Biden's bus because, you know, she wants political power and that's the easiest bet. You know, he's probably going to win. She could have done that in 2016 with Hillary Clinton. So I'm genuinely confused by her motives here. I, I don't get it. This is someone who's young and talented, who could make a difference, a real difference. And she's choosing to defend Biden here when you can't defend him. So look, I don't want to get, you know, too caught up on Simone Sanders because, again, I do respect her. But in terms of her trying to defend Joe Biden, this is why you can't defend people like Joe Biden. You can't. His record speaks for itself. And he'll say something, and all you have to do is look it up to see that he is full of shit. So Joe Biden, um, I really hope that this post announcement bump fades and quickly because in the event he becomes the Democratic Party nominee, I worry so much about him losing to Donald Trump. I do. I think his chances are probably better than Hillary's because I think just strategically, he kind of knows a little bit more about what he's doing. However, with that being said, he's so out of touch that what I worry about is people being demoralized, the Democratic Party's base being demoralized and not coming out to vote, which means that Republicans will win. And this doesn't just hurt the Democratic Party's chances of retaking the Senate when the odds are technically in their favor, just because of the makeup. I mean, you have Democrats defending 12 seats and Republicans defending 22 seats. But I mean, this can all go south really quickly if we get someone at the top of the ticket who doesn't get people who normally don't vote to come out and vote. We need young people to vote. We need non-voters to come out and vote. Joe Biden just can't do that. So I worry. I absolutely worry. Um, and I hope that Bernie wins because if Biden is the uh, nominee, we could be looking at another four years of Donald Trump. If anyone's going to beat Donald Trump, it's going to be Bernie. I'm putting my money on Bernie, right? Anti-establishment versus, you know, pseudo anti-establishment. If you want to get rid of Donald Trump, you go for the antithesis of Trumpism and pseudo, you know, um, populism. So we'll see what happens. But this just goes to show you that Joe Biden will have a tough time. He may be having a really great entry point into the campaign season because nobody's really able to bring him down. But if this continues, I mean, I can't see how his poll numbers remain high because these things are horrible blemishes on his record that he's trying to run away from, but can't. You can't say that the crime bill didn't lead to mass incarceration when everyone knows that it did, especially the people who were affected by it the most, blacks and Latinos. So, um, yeah, I'll leave that there.